Will the congregation please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's an interesting passage we have here this morning in Acts chapter 17, where Paul was wandering around and around for a while, we kind of missed some of that, and then here he winds up in Athens, and he's arguing with people in the temple, and then he's wandering around the city of Athens and looking at stuff and talking to whoever would listen to him, right? There's a lot of stuff going on here, but before we dive into that, I want to tell you all about an article I recently read in the Harvard Business Review. You're impressed. <laughs> Don't be too impressed here. But actually, it's a really good article. And it actually talks about what this lesson to me is about today. Because how many of you, before I get to my article from the Harvard Business Review, know the Bible well enough to talk to somebody about your faith? I got one, I think so, is what she said as she wrote and raised her hand up here. Which is actually good because that's our youth worker. So, <laughs> so nobody else? Nobody else? You need a little work, maybe? By the end of the day, I'm going to have every last one of you raise your hand. Are you ready for that? The article from the Harvard Business Review is called To Change Someone's Mind, Stop Talking and Listen. Hello? Right on cue. That's uh, I'll pay you later. Whoever that was, I'll pay you later. The article is, I'm going to paraphrase it. I've got a big chunk of it here, though. But um, Samar, and I'm sorry, Samar Khan, I'm going to murder her name, I think. It's Samar, S A M A R. Minala Khan is a feminist Pakistani anthropologist and filmmaker, and she's enraged by some of the stuff that's happening in her country because local tribal leaders will trade little girls as compensation for male family members' crimes. This is something that happens in the tribes of Pakistan. And she was enraged, and these leaders are responsible for setting legal disputes in their villages by, and acting as local judges, this is a long-standing practice that addresses major crimes by compensating a harmed family with the daughter of a family doing the harm. The guilty father or uncle was then considered free, and the village was told that the issue is resolved. And Samar thought this tradition, called the Swara, was horrendous. And it forever changed this young, these young women's lives, through no fault of their own. But although she was angry, she realized she'd never get the outcome she wanted if she led with anger. So she listened. She listened to people talk. She listened to the male religious leaders talk about this process. She listened to the fathers who had to give their daughters up in this process. She listened to families and she listened to what she needed to hear in order to understand this process and to bridge this chasm which she thought was something that needed to happen. So she listened to all of these people and then she brought all these people together and had them, and, and had them watch videos. Right? When she talked to these fathers and she talked to the religious leaders, she videotaped all of these conversations. And then she brought the people together and they watched the videos of these conversations and realized that this process that they'd been doing because of tradition was something that they shouldn't be doing anymore because it wasn't helpful to anybody in the villages. And if she had gone in guns blazing and said this process is wrong and these little children are being damaged, do you think it would have changed anything? But she changed the way she looked at stuff. She changed the process by which she used. And she listened to the people. And she learned about their customs. And she learned about their ways of life from them. And then brought them together to talk about what had happened. That's actually what happens in our text today. Whether you realize that or not. Paul wandered around the city of Athens and looked at all the stuff that was happening, realized that they're a very religious crowd, and they had an altar to an unknown god, and he, when he was invited to the Areopagus, the Areopagus is basically a big rock, which was the gathering place for, for um, Stoics, for those who liked to talk about things and learn new things, right? You think When you think of Greek philosophy, think of people who would sit around all day, it says that they just shared new news, 
Anything that was new, these people wanted to hear about. So they would meet at this Oropagus, this place, this gathering place, and they would sit and they would talk for hours and hours about new things that were happening, or new ideas that were out there. And after Paul had wandered around and argued with the people in the temple, which if you read the, the, the journeys of Paul in the books of Acts, a lot of it is Paul traveling to these different cities and arguing with people in the temple. And when he argues with these Jews, the Jews usually go, you need to die. And they try to kill him. And so they, they, he just leaves the temples and goes talks to other people. The other people are more receptive to him. But he stands at the, he stands at the Oropagus when he's talking to these people. And he says to them, what you know as unknown, let me reveal to you. And what does he quote to them? Did you read the story? Did you hear it? Sarah, Sarah Bethany, can you come read it again? No? Okay. He said, I went throughout the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, and I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God, and what therefore you worship as unknown, this I will proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life to everyone and breath to all things. From our, ancestors and nation, from our ancestors, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth in the lot of times in existence, in the boundaries and places where they would live, so that you would search for God and perhaps find him, because he's not that far from us, far from any of us. And then Paul said to them this, For in him we live and move and have our being. Where does that come from? I just watched a show yesterday, which I knew was on before, but I found it again as we were... We were Streaming, looking through stuff, and what was it called? The Bible, the American Bible Challenge. Has anybody heard of that show? It was um, hosted by Jeff Foxworthy. It's actually an interesting show. And the and the one portion of this, they ask questions about the Bible. It's called the American Bible Challenge. So they ask questions about the Bible. And one of the set of questions in the in the episode we watched yesterday was, "Is this the word of the Lord or the the Lord of the Rings?" Right. So they read a quote. And you had to decide, is this from the Bible, or is it from the Lord of the Rings? So I wonder, is this quote, for in, in him we live and move and have our being, is that from the Bible, or is that from something else? Those of you who think it's from, I'm not show, I want to show hands. Those of you who think it's from the Bible, raise your hand. Those of you who think it's from something else, raise your hand. If you notice, I do what I do in confirmation. I raise my hand both times so that you can't look at me to see what the answer is. <laughs> the answer is, it comes from something else. It's not actually from the Bible. He actually is quoting here, which the text actually tells us. He's quoting one of their poets. Even as some of your poets have said. This, this line actually comes from a poem by Epimenides, which starts, They fashioned a tomb for you, O high and holy ones. And it finishes, for in you we live and move and have our being. And then he quoted again another one of their, their poets, for we too are his offspring. See, when Paul is standing in the Oropagus and he's talking to these philosophers, does he quote scripture to them? No. Why? Say it a little louder. They probably don't know it. And if they did, they don't know it as well as their own philosophers. So Paul learned his context. He went around Athens and he Listen. listened to what was happening. He observed their environment. He observed what was happening. And he went, when he went to talk to them about who God was and who Jesus could be in their lives, he didn't quote scripture to them and try to berate them with that. He, he brought to them their own community. He brought to them their own understanding. He talked about God in a way that they could understand it. And the verses that we miss here, the last three verses of this chapter, actually talk about that. Right? It says that some of them scoffed at Paul. Some of them said, what, what kind of an idea is this? Some of them said, I'd really like to hear more about this. And some of them, when Paul left the Oropagus that day, actually left with him and journeyed on with him. You know what? And Paul left. And Luke doesn't say that Paul left in a huff. It says that Paul went about his way. Maybe God was calling him on to someplace else at that point. So he left the Oropagus and went somewhere else. 
Some of them listened and thought they wanted to hear more. Some of them thought that it was a stupid idea. And some of them thought that it was a, that it was a good idea and followed along with him so that they could learn more along the way. You see, we think we have to know enough scripture so that we can impress those around us by being able to quote scripture left and right and just know it without even thinking about it because that's what people want to hear from us when we talk to them about our faith. And you know what? That's not going to be helpful for all people. Do you need to know the Bible? Absolutely. You need to know the Bible. You need to know this book. That's one of the reasons we've started doing the, the lectionary that we have been doing. So that we can dig in and know the stories of the Bible and understand what this book is. And why is this book important? Because it's, some say it's the Word of God. It shows us ways that we should live and understand. It, t it gives you your story. Right? When you go to family reunions, you gather with families, you all tell stories. Right? There's some of them that aren't written down and there's some that you don't tell in polite company. Right? <laughs> if you've ever read parts of this, there's some of that in here. That you, there's stories in here you don't tell in polite company. There's stories in here that put God and our understanding of our faith in bad lights. Do you know what? That's the good and the bad. That's the history of our families. That's the understanding of our story. It's knowing who we are in God and how God has called us to move and to live. And when Paul met these people at the Oropagus, rather than trying to beat them upside the head with the scriptures, he brought them the word of God in their own understanding and in their own light. And he showed them how God could be with them even in their own understandings. So yes, you need to know this book. But you don't need to know it to be able to quote it verse for verse back to somebody. Because God has already given you everything that you need to know to be able to share your faith with someone else. How many of you believe that? That's more hands than I saw at the beginning, so that's good. At least we're making progress. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter if you can quote scripture. All you need to be able to do is talk about how God has lived in and through your life in a way that other people are going to hear it. To end this morning, I've got a quote from... Pastor Dave Dowert, who used to be um, head of the Mission Outreach Division of the ELCA and is now a pastor in Chicago area. Um, and in his devotion, he writes a Thursday devotion for his congregation. And in that devotion, his last paragraph is something that I think is, is beautiful for our understanding of how we need to listen to our context, live within the world, and then talk about God in a way that interacts with people where they're at. Not trying to tell them that they're wrong, but living with them in the moment and showing them how God has given you love and God will also give them love. And in a way then, work on their hearts to help them understand how Jesus has called each and every one of us to follow him. Pastor Dalbert says, it is not our job to save the world. God in Christ is doing that. But we can share openly and respectfully what we see God doing and maintain good relationships with the people around us, whether they end up believing what we believe or not.